Hello, welcome everyone to the 14th webinar, the final one this year in the New Barn Raising webinar series. Today's subject is placemaking and public space. My name is Gareth Potts, I'm the guy who uh, set up the webinar series and also a wider program, the New Barn Raising program. There is a website, the newbarnraising.com. It has a lot of very practical materials in terms of a toolkit, uh, articles summarizing the key aspects of the toolkit and details of previous and forthcoming webinars. The focus is all around different ways to raise awareness, uh, to raise resources, and to raise volunteer help for sustaining different types of community and civic assets. In terms of today's focus, uh, the broad issue is placemaking. The two presentations are not directly comparable, but hopefully a very similar audience will be interested in both presentations. The first presentation from Pittsburgh really addresses the question of how can anchor assets, so, so larger types of uh, civic asset, in this case uh, a children's museum, work with other organizations, often themselves uh, assets, to help build sustainability of, of the different organizations together and, and to some extent therefore that area itself to keep that area sustainable. The second issue from the Toronto presentation looking at privately owned public spaces or POPs is uh, how do we increase the number and quality and awareness of these quasi or de facto public spaces. From um, the Children's Museum Pittsburgh, Chris Seifert has been Deputy Director since 2007. He began his studies with a degree in landscape architecture at Cornell University. He then, after graduating, worked for several leading interdisciplinary des design teams, including Cesar Pelli, and Balmori. He then came to Pittsburgh for a Master's in Fine Arts at Carnegie Mellon University, following which he taught sculpture at Louisiana State University. He then moved back in the late 1990s to Pittsburgh to be Director of Exhibits and then Project Manager for the $28 million expansion that was completed in 2004. He's received two international fellowships, both of which are very heavily focused around museum leadership. The Getty Leadership Institute in 2000 and the Noyce Leadership uh, Institute in 2013. Within Pittsburgh, he also has several key roles in terms of serving on the steering committee of the Allegheny Commons, so uh, the oldest park in, in the city. Uh, he's also vice president of a public-private partnership, the Northside Cultural Collaborative, and he's then president of the Pittsburgh Dynamo Youth Soccer Association. The second speakers are from the City of Toronto Planning Division. First speaker will be James Parrack. Uh, James is the manager of urban design for the Toronto and East York part of the metro area. And over the last decade, James has led the urban design studio that has helped review all development in downtown Toronto and surrounds. He's also uh, a lot of private sector experience prior to this in urban design, in project design, and as a project architect on both national and international projects. He is a licensed architect and in 2008 won a major award from the Ontario Architectural Association. He's also on the advisory group of councils for tall buildings and urban habitat. He's been on that since last year and he holds graduate degrees in architecture and urban design from Houston and Columbia, respectively. Joining James is his, his colleague, Shauna Bowen, who also works in urban design in the same section. She's been employed by the city since 2010. Amongst her main projects has been uh, working on a five-year review of the city plans urban design policies and working on urban design guidelines for POPs and for the development application review. Uh, she too has previously worked in, in the private sector in planning and urban design. Shauna holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Ryerson University and a master's in urban planning from McGill. So those are the speakers. And uh, without further ado now, I'm gonna pass you over to Chris Seifert in Pittsburgh. Um, hello everyone. Thanks Garrett for the introduction and um, thanks everyone for joining today. The Children's Museum of Pittsburgh is located on what is known as the north side of Pittsburgh. You can see in this map here the three rivers going, uh, heading to the west. So we have the Allegheny coming from the northeast and the Monongahela coming from the southeast. They join at the point and then head west, creating the, the start of the Ohio River. Um, the north side, historically, was actually a city in and of itself called Allegheny. And it was in 1907 that Pittsburgh um, annexed Allegheny, and it became part of the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and that began sort of the idea that this is not, it's, it, that, that this district would be known as the North Side. 
and it's made up of approximately um, 18 or 19 neighborhoods. It sort of depends on who you talk to and how you count on how you define a neighborhood. So nestled within that, um, right at the center of the north side, is the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh. And in 2004, um, after been established for um, close to 20, uh, a little over 30 years, uh, the Children's Museum expanded. We grew from 20,000 square feet in an old former post office building. We took over a vacant building next door, uh, the former View Planetarium, and we did this by creating an addition, a linking building, uh, and we grew from 20,000 to 80,000 square feet. Uh, it was at that time that during the strategic planning, the board of directors and the staff uh, settled on goals for the expansion, and they included uh, the highest pursuit of art and design, uh, community engagement, and innovation in all that we do. Uh, we conducted a series of community engagement processes and design charrettes, and we uh, were awarded a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, um, and we conducted a design competition and the winner for that was uh, Koning Eisenberg Architecture out of Santa Monica. Um, through all of this, our mission was revisited and we landed on a very straightforward mission to provide innovative museum experiences that inspire joy, creativity, and curiosity. Uh, we don't define museum experiences as those that have to actually be physically on site. And so we do a lot of outreach and we do a lot of work, as I mentioned, out in our community. Um, one of the unique aspects of the uh, expansion project was that we created space for other organizations who needed either office or program space or areas to also um, do collaborative type work. Uh, these six partners uh, continue with us to this day um, I will say this was 2004, and we have had partners come and go. So at some points, we've had up to nine partners on site. And at some points, uh, we were actually allies for children, for instance, actually went away, and then they came back. Um, so there's a lot of ebb and flow in that. We do charge them for rent within the museum. We charge 50% of the market rate. Um, and then we offer them access to various program spaces um, and depending on the type of organization, the, that type of space will, will be different. So for instance, for the Saturday Light Brigade radio programs, during our 2004 expansion, we actually partnered with them and built a radio broadcasting booth on site, and they, um, they continue to use that to this day. Every Saturday, their program is broadcast. In completing the expansion, we would convene sort of uh, groups of people to kind of reflect on what went well and what didn't go well. And um, one of the things that really stood out were the partnerships. Um, and during these conversations, we became aware of the multitude of organizations that are on the north side of Pittsburgh. And those organizations, in fact, could possibly benefit from greater conversations, such as the ones that we had with our partners in developing the program for the expansion. So we created a very deliberate effort to convene the um, uh, executive directors from these multiple organizations and just started to begin the question of, um, what are you doing? And we found the best way to do this, by the way, is over wine and beer at, at uh, one of our institutions. So while well, we began to understand that everyone had their own agendas and we actually started to share agendas and this unfolded over a couple of a couple of meetings um, but some things started to stand out and i think it's important to understand that the way programs develop is through what i call a, a, and what has been referred to as you know a sort of sense of urgency so one of the things that we found was that even though we're all doing really good work uh, we really don't have a lot of connections either physically or programmatically by and amongst ourselves. Um, another thing that we came to understand was that we all understood where we were going on our own campus, our own master plan. Um, but 
And we did occasionally, obviously, do some partnerships and some programming together, and that was usually rather successful. But when we started to look at the broader landscape that we sat in, the sort of urban condition that we set in, we realized that there was a lot of area in the north side that was being neglected. And by neglected, I mean just wasn't quite having the opportunity for arts and cultural experiences. And this is what we can bring to our community. Um, and then there were other organizations that started to hear about our meetings and actually wanted to become a part of our community because we started to create an, an effort to, um, to, to work together. And that attracts people. Uh, another, so we had this lack of connections. We have limited sharing of agendas. And the final sort of urgency issue has to do with the urban condition. This is an image that was fabricated by an architect of what the north side looked like at, in 1960s prior to urban renewal. And if you can see the green dome building in the middle, that's basically the site of the Children's Museum. And this is what the north side looked like after urban revitalization. Um, and you can see that the grid from the previous slide, the street grid and the density of the condition, urban, urban condition has given way to a one-way loop road. Um, so here we have a, a, a pedestrian campus that has been created around what the Children's Museum would, would end up sitting, um, but the lack of connectivity to the uh, um, rest of the neighborhood has been seriously compromised. So during our meetings of why, why we're getting together and determining what the value of our coalition could become, we started to recognize that you know, we, we have a lot to offer the community. We, we, we have connections. We have facilities. And in fact, we can raise money easier than often the city can. Um, and secondly, if we think about a contribution to the north side in terms of community development, uh, what do we bring? Well, we can bring quality of place and we can contribute to quality of life. Um, and on a certain scale, we, we actually contribute to the work for, workforce and economic development as well. We also recognize that, you know, it's not completely new. Um, organizations such as museums and, and theater groups and so forth often produce a physical revitalization in some way or form. They, they often go through a growth where they have to deal with real estate and construction and renovation, and that necessitates community engagement. Um, we're often also places for convening. Uh, just tonight, for instance, the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh is hosting a community meeting on um, educational issues around public schools in the city of Pittsburgh, um, and that's very common. And as a collective, um, if you think about what we do in the collective sense, we're obviously making a difference already in our communities. But we want it to be more deliberate, and we want it to actually be um, to try to tie these things together in a, in a more cohesive fashion. So in 2007, we launched the, the Charm Bracelet Project. And the deliberate action here was to really gather uh, outside voices and to create a program of collaboration um, amongst the different assets of the North Side, specifically the arts and cultural and educational assets. Um, so we invited design teams in and presented them with this challenge of lack of connectivity, of limited sharing and joining of agendas, and um, in context of the urban uh, renewal uh, uh, um, footprint that's been left behind, um, what, what could you envision? Uh, these four design teams uh, came up with dozens of projects. Um, and in doing this with a community engagement process, we, we came to the conclusion that uh, we could find a way to um, join together in both urban design initiatives, um, marketing initiatives, but more importantly, collaborative programming in those spaces that fall in between our different campuses. So the Charm Bracer project was then positioned 
away, sort of directly away from the executive directors of the organizations and move to the sort of mid-level managers of the different organizations. Um, and this was another direct way that we wanted to encourage buy-in from uh, the people that, that work in these different organizations so that it could become a part of their day-to-day -day work environment rather than some project that's handed to them from above. Um, and they established that we would um, uh, become a resource and network for each other, and we would create a vision for street-level le activity through uh, programs in what we call the everyday space. And um, this is just one example where uh, this vision created a lot of interest from philanthropic organizations in and around the city of Pittsburgh. Um, we, we received several different funding, several different grants with different funding uh, goals. Um, this one came through what's called the microgrant program. I think we had three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars in that program. That was designated for small projects of collaborative in nature that would bring together two or three different collaborators and do something off of the campuses of the different organizations. And this was a um, public art performance produced by Julia Mandel, where she worked with youth at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild to um, create chalk shoes. And then they hosted a performance where the different executive directors of the different organizations actually walked across the north side with youth, um, scratching their chalk shoes and showing the paths to this wonderful, beautiful historic park that we have. And that ended in a celebration um, these are just a couple of other quick examples. We did a lot of work with um, youth and um, artists collaborating together, um, and we did a lot of work with youth and um, seniors collaborating together. Uh, these are two community art projects uh, that occurred, um, again, off of our campuses in different, um, more or less uh, challenging areas of the, of the community. Um, the, the one on the top here, the Perry Pearls Girls Empowering Girls, this is a, a, group, a, a mentoring group in a local high school, and their request of the Charm Bracelet Microgrant Program was $200 for a dinner to where they could thank their mentors and recognize the young women who went through this program. So we funded projects at that very little small amount, but it made a big difference to them. Um, and then the one below this, this is a, another one where artists are working with youth and connecting them with seniors and uh, sharing stories and then sharing recipes and sharing meals together over time. So you can begin to see how those small microgram projects could really create an array of street level activity. Uh, they, as I mentioned, we did about three dozen of those different types of projects over a four or five year span, and some of them continue on today. A larger scale project was when the Children's Museum, Warhol Museum, and the city of Pittsburgh came together to revitalize the theater that had gone dark. Um, here we created a new 501c3 through two rather unlikely partners, a children's museum and an avant-garde art museum. And we've created a new community space that is very much thriving today. And um, this was a two and a half million dollar capital project. And uh, they, as I mentioned, they're currently thriving and operating today. Um, another project that came out of the initial brainstorming sessions was the revitalization of entry points into the neighborhood. Uh, here we had a decrepit railroad bridge that the railroad company had no interest in painting or maintaining. And uh, we raised uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars to kind of clean up the drainage problems, paint the bridge, and then create a gallery where we showcase um, individual artworks. Uh, we've been rotating artworks through this on an annual basis. Um, and in our fourth year, the railroad actually decided to remove and replace the bridge. So we're on hiatus for a couple of years while they do that. But when they're done, we'll go back and, and um, continue to use this as a public art gallery. One of the larger projects that we undertook, um, you can see right in front of the Children's Museum of Pittsburgh here, is the uh, 
Allegheny Public Square, which is a sunken plaza established during that urban renewal process in the 1960s. Um, historically, if we go back even to the city of Allegheny, um, you can see that this has always been a park, it used to be called Diamond Square. And just to the north of that, where it says City Hall and Post Office, that's where the Children's Museum sits. Um, again, because of the annexation of, of Allegheny by Pittsburgh, that went away. Um, but historically, this, is, this was the center and, and focus of the former city of Allegheny. Um, so the park itself, back in the early 1920s, before urban renewal and before um, the removal of the government building, which you can see to the left there, uh, was a, essentially a very simple um, quadrangle with a fountain at the center. And the, actually in the 30s, it was redesigned. And so what you're looking at there in the 60s is before urban renewal, um, it was designed as a, um, just a, a, a large lawn. There was also a large feature to it. And after urban renewal in the 60s, as I mentioned, it became a sunken concrete plaza um, with very little use. It's about an acre and a half, and 80% of it was impermeable pavement. So again, we launched a community engagement process. We um, invited the community in for several different um, discussions, and then we had a very special day in the park where we had uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of people show up and kind of share what their vision of that park would be. Um, we then compiled a program for that park and invited six design firms into another design competition process. And the winner of that was Andrea Cochran Landscape Architecture. Um, so here is a view of the plaza prior to renovation. And then this is what it looks like today. Um, I mentioned the 80% impervious. We now have 80% pervious surface. So. Uh, we, we like to say we took a sock that was inside out and turned it right side out. Um, so here we have um, the Children's Museum taking a leadership role. This was approximately a $6.1 million, $6 million project. And it's a city-owned park. Uh, we had to work very closely with the city in terms of access to the park and in review of the design so that it met all of the standards for uh, public access and use. And these are some beauty shots. You can see the uh, stainless steel poles here. This is an artwork by Ned Kahn. Um, in the lower right, you can see how the mist creates kind of a large cloud formation, and then it slowly dissipates. Uh, this happens every three to five minutes. Um, and the park is heavily used. Of course, the photos that I'm sh sharing are, are on some of our very proactive days when we program it with uh, guest chefs during lunch or, or evening uh, community events. Our next project will be the former Allegheny Library Building, which sits right next door to the Children's Museum. Um, this is a 45,000 square foot National Historic Landmark, and it's adjacent to the New Hazlet Theater, uh, which was renovated by the Warhol and Children's Museum back in 06. Uh, the library, this tower was struck by lightning in 2006, and the library um, function was moved to a new building about 10 blocks away. The exciting thing about this project is the 45,000 square feet of space. It's also the daunting thing. It's uh, owned by the city of Pittsburgh, and it is a historic landmark. But what we've come to recognize is, through our community meetings is that what what the community is seeking, and not just the stakeholders of the arts and cultural organizations, but the community in general, is really looking for a sort of a center or a hub where all these different activities that we're doing that contribute to the quality of life and contribute to the quality of place can have a, a presence and can become a, a almost a loci for the community. Um, so we are partnering with uh, several organizations. I mentioned the radio program. They're, they're expanding, and they will be a significant partner. Uh, Reading is Fundamental is another partner. And we're working with a local school on the idea of a middle school um, that could, could occur in this building, and our own program of expanding our teacher mentoring and teacher development uh, offerings. So we envision a center where 
there's a lot of making going on, a lot of uh, opportunity for youth to um, see things from start to finish in terms of their education, the, the idea of like farm to table kind of stuff. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for robotics and circuitry. Um, and on top of that is a whole layer of working with the, on the professional development side to train teachers about how to bring this into their curriculum. Um, most of what I shared with you can be found in a small publication that's available um, at, on, on, online at etc.cmu.edu. You can also find us at lulu.com, although if you go to the Carnegie Mellon ETC website, you can download a PDF for free. So very quickly, um, upon reflecting on the last decade of work or more, um, these are some skills and attributes that I think are required to do this kind of work when you, when you start in an arts and cultural organization and try to reach out into the community and participate in what might be referred to as community development. You know, stay within and work where, where you, you know your strengths. Um, however, um, I think we found a lot of ways to stretch and to be adaptive and to recognize that um, our technical expertise lies in other things, but we're all very smart people and we can be adaptive. Um, and I, I, I mentioned quickly the idea of urgency and coalition and vision in that order. You know, really understanding what the issues are, um, using that to, to build your coalition, which then establishes your vision, rather than having a vision up front. Um, and this idea of making an offer really comes from the world of improv comedy, where when you're working with other people, you, you say yes and. You, you help to, to advance the narrative, and, and you try to do that in such a way that you make the person across from you look good. Um, and this idea of the uh, uh, urgency coalition vision is, is not new. It comes out of John Cotter's work through at, up in Harvard. Um, but I think it's important to kind of emphasize this as you begin to look at ways might be transforming or changing in your own organizations or in your own uh, urban environments. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Chris. We all hear about partnership and leadership. Clearly, your work and the work of the museum has kind of exemplified that. Uh, and it comes to the time now, so I'm going to quickly pass you over to James in Toronto. Great. Thanks, Gareth. And Chris, I wanted to say I very much enjoyed uh, your presentation and learning about Pittsburgh. I'm going to talk along with my colleague, Shauna Bowen, about our POPs branding and POPs initiative, which stands for Privately Owned Publicly Accessible Space. Um, the logo is, is, is part of our signage program, which will be located in all of our future spaces. And I touch upon the personalities and characters of these spaces. Uh, we're going to go and show you some case studies. We're going to talk about console direction. My colleague Shauna will run through the urban design guidelines, talk about the signage and the website. Uh, and first of all, I'll start off by saying that POPs really are not a replacement for um, our parks system, but it's something that is uh, adding on to the park system that we have here in Toronto. So what are POPs? As I mentioned, it's an acronym that stands for Privately Owned Publicly Accessible Space. Uh, I start here with a, with a new plaza, Arnell Plaza, uh, taken about three years ago. And look at the trees in the same space in that last time period. So you can certainly see the growing need for greenery in an urban environment, especially one that is rapidly growing uh, as Toronto is. Toronto in the downtown has seen more tall buildings in the past 12 years than New York, Chicago, and Vancouver combined. Um, Pops are spaces for social gathering and interaction. Places to view public art, both in larger settings, smaller settings, unusual settings like underneath the highway overpass ramp, and places and uh, and also places to dine, uh, places to grab a coffee, and places of retreat, uh, like this space with a water wall and water feature. Uh, places to celebrate urban pageantry, space designed by architect I.M. Pei, 
one of my favorites, and places to engage in civic life. So that's just a quick snapshot. So it's a specific type of open space where the public is invited to use, but they remain privately owned and maintained. They are part of the city's public realm network, providing open space in much needed locations across the city that complement existing and planned publicly owned parks, open spaces, and our natural areas. So here's a, just a few case studies, and, and, and we in the planning department work very closely with the development industry to make sure that uh, we can achieve these on an ad needed basis. And it's not every site, of course, that we, we look for these spaces, but on larger sites we may, and depending upon the type. I'm going to run through these examples that you see on screen. Um, starting with 300 Front, which is located here on our skyline. So many of you may recognize the CN Tower, which is one of our landmarks. Uh, it's on John Street, which is our culture corridor. It's actually at the bottom end, where we have a number of civic and important institutions. Original proposal you see on the left-hand side did not have an open space. It actually had a suburban-style drop-off. Um, we actually did a sketch that you see on the right-hand side to flip the building to make sure that we did have a park across from now a city park. So this is two spaces, one city-owned in the foreground and the other one which would be privately owned. Uh, you could see the plan on the left in terms of how the two spaces could work together and some of the original concepts by the landscape architect Claude Cormier, the final rendering of that space, uh, which is now finished and occupied. So looking down now from the CN Tower, our landmark, you can see that space and how it sort of works with the city park to frame an urban room, if you will. And then coming across the bridge uh, over the railway tracks, again, you could see how that space is fitted out. Another space not too far by, but a very different type of POPs. This is in between two parks. This is in conjunction with the RBC Ritz-Carlton Hotel. An overall aerial view, uh, and you can see Lake Ontario in the distance, but this space in between two parks, we wanted to make sure that we had these connections. So in this case, the POPs is actually a pedestrian connection too, if you will, on either side of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel linking park to park. So we study these spaces. This is staff drawing, very simple to understand the proportions, the animation of these spaces, and the finished space today. Uh, and there's a restaurant use on the left that has a seasonal summer outdoor cafe that also helps, helps animate this linear space that leads to Simcoe Park. Uh, so the rendering of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel and the finished building, and again, the pop space is on the left and right-hand side of this image that you see leading from one park space to another. Uh, and now these are the same aerial shots that I showed you before, but you could see the green arrows. So in this one very small block, you could see how pops form and expand upon the public realm and the urban network, expanding upon the additions of city parks. Talking about uh, Four Seasons Hotel now, when we wrote guidelines, we talked about views of protections of historic landmarks, like the old fire hall that you see here. Uh, the project is now finished from our guidelines. You could see the protection of the fire hall uh, and how it's framed by two open spaces. One is a city park on the right-hand side or on the east side of these historic landmarks, a fire hall and library. And on the west side, we have another new urban space, which is a POPs. Um, thinking about the design inspired by Victorian architecture being the Victorian Fire Hall and Library, the landscape architect talked about themes like the Rose Garden, which became the publicly accessible open space, and the car drop-off, which became a Victorian carpet, if you will, for the hotel. Looking at the block in aerial, and you can see how a city park on the right is, is working with a private park on the left, and they both frame uh, the historical landmarks on this block in Yorkville. So this is the before, notice the blank wall adjacent to the clock tower and how that has been opened up so that now the view from the west, uh, the clock tower becomes a sort of campanile. And similar to the space that Chris showed, uh, misting fountain uh, designed by uh, an artist is something that forms and animates the space and you can certainly see the nighttime images of the space and also uh, the misting fountain which was written in up in uh, Toronto Life magazine which is a local publication that we have here is one of the the cool new spaces in the city of Toronto in terms of reasons why we love Toronto and there's just a view of the misting fountain at night
Um, and then we didn't stop there looking at opportunities for the south, the staff sketch in terms of the clock tower uh, and how the developer has responded in terms of making sure we have this view protection responding to the clock tower as well. I'm going to talk about uh, Fort York Boulevard, a major park uh, on the, which is the Green Star, an eight-acre park in a developing part of Toronto, formerly railway lands, and then a pedestrian bridge on the left, which is the Yellow Star, and then a pop space, which is actually contained and connects these spaces. So in the park, we have a lot of fanciful public art, uh, and then between the towers and underneath a bridge, uh, we see a publicly accessible, privately owned open space. And certainly you can see there are things like markets that pop into and adjacent to these spaces. This is in the bridge when you actually look out onto Lake Ontario, out at the public park, and then down through a glass floor because when you have a bridge, of course, you have to have a glass floor at the privately owned open space below and how that links onto a pedestrian bridge which takes you and connects you to another neighborhood. So and again this, this place, the Pops, is a linking space and you can see how the plaque was unveiled. Uh, the plaque is actually uh, the, on, the, uh, on the granite bench. Uh, and then this is the actual view of the plaque itself. And another view of how these are uh, in these publicly accessible open spaces. And the last case study I'm going to show you is Union Plaza, uh, a space that is framed by three buildings, including our main hockey and basketball arena downtown. A couple of ingredients includes a new south entrance to Union Station, our main train station, that actually opens up onto this new space. And then the idea of a major video screen to program and help animate this space. Uh, this was for the launch of our Pan Am Games logo where we are always anticipating that the space would be used by a couple of hundred people. But we never expected this. The thousands of people that would gather to watch a hockey game or a basketball game uh, and to watch it for free adjacent to the hockey arena. Uh, and even in basketball, uh, you could see the basketball fans. So the, the space has been rebranded, in this case Jurassic Park, because the Raptors is the the, uh, the symbol for the Toronto basketball team. Uh, so just some images again of Maple Leaf Square. You know, last year for us it didn't work out that well in terms of the championship, but there's always hope and there's always next year. So now I'm going to pass it to my colleague Shauna that's going to talk about the urban design guidelines. Thanks very much, James. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the POPs program, um, as we call it, um, and what uh, Toronto City Council had uh, directed planning staff to look at. And James has given us a great number of uh, precedents that have already been built. And you'll see coming forward in the guidelines, we're sort of looking at the best of those spaces and what's really working and um, put those forward in our guidelines. Um, so what City Council, Toronto City Council had asked us to do was identify existing POPs, so POPs that had been built um, within the last several years to the last several decades, um, to develop a signage template so that we could actually retroactively go back and uh, potentially sign those spaces and then also moving forward as we build new spaces to um, provide signage within those spaces to make sure that they're clearly legible as public spaces. And then of course to develop the design guidelines um, for new POPs. And of course, as James already uh, talked about, we use urban design guidelines to facilitate discussions um, with the development community, with councillors and with the public um, so that there's a clear understanding of what sort of things we're looking at in terms of of um, design and orientation. So this is just a, a screenshot of the table of contents for the POPs guidelines um, that we developed. It was a 30-page document um, that we uh, took forward to City Council um, in June of 2014 and was um, subsequently adopted by City Council. So as James already uh, mentioned, POPs are a special type of open space. They're not intended to replace public parks, but rather to supplement them. And I think this diagram um, helps to illustrate that and some of James's case studies help to illustrate that as well, that we're really looking at these spaces to supplement the open space network. So they're filling in gaps between parks, they're providing walkways between parks, they're opening up view of corridors between open spaces, and just really helping to enliven the public realm. So providing spaces where we may see a lot of activity and they be, may become focal points for that type of activity. And again, these spaces are not intended to be the leftover spaces between, between buildings. Um, 
We want to make sure that they're working with the building and site program. So in some cases, they may be responding to desire lines that already exist between spaces or um, looking at places where we can provide those spaces so that they're in a comfortable space, so that they are on the south side of the building, they're not being shadowed by new developments, and that they're comfortable spaces for people to, to spend time in. Respecting and celebrating heritage. Um, of course, on the right, you see the image that James has already showed us with the fire hall. And of course, we have on the left, um, an older uh, pedestrian walkway between two buildings so that we're setting up these spaces to respect heritage and provide those sight lines where we may not have had them before. And that they actually can become spaces that people will use. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the typologies that we addressed in our guidelines. Um, uh, these range from large open spaces such as plazas, the Union Station Plaza that James um, had an image of before, to the sort of smaller scale and mid-block connections. So the first one that we identified was courtyards, of course. These are sort of the more intimate spaces, spaces in between buildings, um, and identifying sort of what amenities, how they should be set up, how they should be oriented, um, so that they are, uh, again, legible as those public spaces. So. Things like seating and trees, of course, we understand seating to be one of the number number one elements in these publicly accessible open spaces because it does, it does give the impression that they are public spaces and that people are encouraged um, and welcome to linger in those spaces. Again, we see the uses of these courtyards being uh, possibly residential or commercial, and of course, the programming will vary depending on the surrounding buildings. And because, of course, we want people to use them um, and courtyards are in uh, an in the center of a, maybe located in the center of a block, we wanna make sure that any walkways that connect those courtyards to the public sidewalk are clearly legible. So again, setting up minimum dimensions for walkways that connect to courtyards, providing signage at the edge of, edges of courtyards and providing sight lines into those spaces so that they feel public and they feel safe for people. Plazas, again, I think James has shown a couple of examples of plazas, but we see these really as the more active um, spaces where people will congregate, people will linger. Um, often they are surrounded by active uses or in commercial centers. This image here is uh, the shops at Don Mills uh, located in North Toronto. And you can see that people are, you know, they've taken their coffee or their book from the surrounding retailers and, and are spending time in this space. Um, during the summer, there's festivals here. And in the winter, they have set up um, warming stations and um, food trucks for, for people to use that space. So these are really the places where we see people spending a lot of time. Um, and again, because we want to encourage people to stay there and be comfortable, they really should be places where there is a lot of sun and opportunity for people to stay warm and, and comfortable in those spaces. Gardens um, are the more intimate or um, rooms created by these landscape features. These are, um, you know, dissimilar to uh, plazas in a way that you don't intend to see big festivals or large groups of people congregating for, uh, for um, those types of uses, but really they are characterized by the landscaping, potentially public art, and that they can be places for people to use in all seasons. Again, sort of looking at the smaller scale of uh, 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 pops, and we see a lot of these in the downtown of Toronto because the blocks are quite dense, and we're looking at any opportunity where we can connect public spaces, be they parks or pops. Um, so again, looking at how those spaces can be designed um, when a development application comes in, identifying um, locations where we would wanna see those types of spaces um, so that they can connect those spaces. And again, so that they're highly visible, safe and comfortable places to be. Four courts, just another, again, small, small scale type of open space that would um, be located at the entrance of a building and often these are combined with other larger um, publicly accessible open spaces such as courtyards or plazas. And landscape setbacks again this is something we see uh, quite a bit of in the downtown area where blocks are tighter um, but where we see the sidewalk width being um, very important because we have large numbers of, of pedestrians uh, using the sidewalks that we can use those landscape setbacks to provide a bit more space for pedestrians to move back and forth and again to provide amenities like landscaping or art. And I'll just run through some of the, uh, the guidelines um, 
a little bit quickly now in the interest of time, but again, pedestrian comfort I spoke of, making sure that there's sky view, sunlight, and um, not locating them in places where there may be adverse wind conditions allowing for pedestrian access and circulation, so defining the pedestrian paths and making sure, again, that they are designed to accessibility standards, um, so reflecting minimum widths and as well um, looking at the different types of paving to make sure that they're not presenting any tripping hazards. And that goes hand in hand, again, with public safety and ensuring that we're providing lighting in these spaces and materials that are, um, that are durable and don't require ongoing maintenance. Activating the edges, that's another thing we, uh, you know, cons in, we would consider in terms of the building program in conjunction with the location of a POPs. Um, and James had shown a, a good example of that at the Ritz-Carlton where we have um, both a, um, a restaurant and cafe and windows to the adjacent building um, aligning that mid box connection. And again, building servicing, this is something, you know, where POPs are not intended to be the leftover space um, on a site. So we want to make sure that the publicly accessible space is distinct from anything like vehicular routes, garbage or loading spaces so that it does, it does feel like a comfortable and usable space for people to be. And seating, as I mentioned, was, was, was addressed as, you know, sort of one of the number one concerns or one of the number one amenities that should be provided in, in a POPs to make people feel like they are welcome to linger in those spaces. Public art, of course, helping to animate the space, landscaping, paving, lighting, weather protection, and other amenities. And this was something that comes up certainly, especially in the downtown where we don't have expansive park spaces. Um, you know, on the image on the right there, you see the dog that's, um, quite an important consideration in the downtown area um, that we know for sure that people need spaces when they leave their high-rise condo, where are they going to take their, their dog for a walk? So, of course, understanding um, programmatically where those, where, those, um, where those uses are needed. And then James has shown you the image of um, our first POPs plaque for Ice Boat Terrace. Of course, uh, Council had asked us to look at developing a signage program in order to increase public accessibility to these spaces, awareness of um, uh, where those spaces are located so that people feel comfortable in using the space. And there is information um, on the signage um, that talks about potentially if there are restrictions on the time of day or the time of, um, the, yeah, the time of day of when they can be used so that it is very clear, clearly understood how those spaces, uh, when and how those spaces can be used. And then along with the signage program, we developed a website um, that identified um, historically and, um, you know, more recently uh, as new spaces were developed, POPs locations across the city. Um, again, because we have a number of um, hundreds actually of, of um, POPs locations around the city, going back and identifying those spaces um, and going through legal agreements and identifying um, where those spaces are and which developments they're associated with was important so that people could look at the map and understand where those spaces exist around the city. And then you can just see from the, the screen here, um, the guidelines and the maps are all available on our website and just some samples of that. And so over the course of um, probably about a year and a half to two years, uh, going through those legal agreements, as I said, and identifying those spaces around the city. So thank you very much um, for listening to the presentation and the link there is our POPs website. Thank you very much, Shauna and uh, James. Okay, we've got time for questions. Um, I'll literally kick off with the very first one on the rank, which is uh, who manages these pop spaces? What is there for people to do in them? I think you've given some indication of what, what there is for, to do in them. But what about the management? The pops are privately owned and privately maintained. So in other words, they would be managed or maintained by the building owner. So if that's an office building, then it would be the, 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 uh, the, the developer. And if it's a residential building, it would be transferred, the ownership would, and maintenance would be transferred to likely a condominium corporation.
So a condo corp would all, would would hire a property manager, and they would be quite familiar with managing all aspects of 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 a condominium, for example. And 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 often uh, uh, an office building owner would would of course have a property management department. So they would be quite familiar with their responsibilities in terms of ongoing maintenance of these spaces, uh, making sure that they are kept uh, kept clean. Uh, it's never been an issue for us. Usually these spaces are the front doors uh, or the living room, if you will, for these particular developments, uh, and we often find that that they they do they do maintain them to to very high standards and manage them to very high standards. Great, thank so you. That, that would that would mean the light bulbs are replaced, the uh, the paving is clean, uh, and the water features, of course, if they are water features, are are functioning during seasonable times. Yeah, thank you. Uh, a question for uh, Chris. Have there been times where potential partnerships have been rejected as out of line with your mission? Well, I'm not sure if rejected is the right word, but there have certainly been times when we've had conversations about the types of partners that we work with and the types of projects or programs that get launched. So it makes me think of two things. One, when we built our partnership for who was coming into the Children's Museum campus, we were very careful to not have partners of a similar ilk, because that could create tension and, and issues. And then when we were doing the microgrant program, essentially the way that worked, every quarter we would put out a call for ideas. We would typically would get between 15 and 25 submissions. We would then convene. We had a, um, a manager committee uh, that would convene and review the, the, the uh, request for funding and then make determinations. Um, so I guess in some sense, some of them were rejected, uh, but or they just didn't make the cut, or they just didn't. Um, we didn't think they were viable or fit in with the with the mission or the or the brand that we were promulgating. Uh, just stay while well, stay with you, Chris. There's another question. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Um, is there adequate training for larger assets to take on this placemaking role? Yeah, it's a good question because um, it often raises. When this type of initiative wants to happen in an arts or cultural organization, it raises questions with the senior leadership or the board of directors about mission and whether or not people are staying on task, whether or not they have the capacity for it, where are the resources coming from. So there, there's a lot of questions that fly around that issue of training, um, which, quite frankly, I think a lot of what's happening is relatively new. Um, there is a report that I just sent a link to the um, question area, uh, a report from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Local Initiative Support Corporation that's highlighting the ways museums and libraries are doing this kind of work. Um, and I think it's on the cusp of leading to more um, relevancy at conferences, and that will translate to more training and, and so forth. So I think it's sort of at that brink. Question here: I get a couple of quite, a couple of related questions, really, about evaluations uh, for the pops. Um, any? Do you eva how do you evaluate their success or measure their impact? So we we are now in the process of of assembling evaluations for pops in terms of measuring their success. You know, we just branded them last year, and then we're assessing um, their functionality and their their use. You know, there's a variety of ways, of course, in which we measure success. Uh, one is just the amount of greenery and the amount of trees that we're adding to the downtown. Uh, the other one is how well programmed they are. And you can see they have a diversity of roles, right? Some are pedestrian connections. So how do you measure that? The number of people that walk through? Uh, some are, of course, places to view fabulous works of public art. And the city of Toronto is now growing, has a growing collection of public art installations. So having natural settings to which one can view and see public art is something that is, of course, very helpful as well. Uh, Teal Core which is a major study that is underway, TO, the short form for Toronto, uh, a major study, is actually doing a public public space, public life survey as well. So as part of that survey, they will be doing an analysis not just of our POPs, but also our parks and open spaces as well. Great. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Do you require any percentage of the POPs to be per pervious surfaces? 
Much of what we have seen shows what appears to be mostly impervious surfacing. Yeah, this is a, no, we don't have a requirement in terms of permeable paving or permeable surfaces. Of course, one of the goals would be to have as much greenery as possible. So you, you, we did show a number of examples where we do have uh, a, a greenery and sod and plantable surfaces, and that's part of part of the main role or part of the main goal. But we don't have a percentage or a requirement in terms of, of, of uh, permeable surfaces versus non-permeable surfaces. Thanks, uh, James. A series of questions here around Buell Park that was mentioned in Chris's presentation about, if you could maybe just elaborate a bit, Chris, please, about funding, what the relationship with the city was, was it a partnership or is it more of an adoption? And how did you manage expectations around what was possible for local people in, in that park? The, the park is a city-owned asset and it remained a city-owned asset for the duration of the construction phase the Children's Museum actually took ownership through a license agreement with the city. Uh, so that's sort of a technicality of how we were able to go onto city property and improve it when, you know, it's not our property. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the project, in terms of the community engagement process, you know, uh, we essentially, and maybe this isn't fair, but we essentially work from a pie-in-the-sky premise with our visitors and with our um, community when we're brainstorming and envisioning ideas or, or a program of, or uses for the park. Um, so we don't want people to get too hung up on, oh, you can't do that or that'll cost too much money. And, um, and then we rely on myself and other professionals to kind of uh, sort of uh, put that through a sieve and, and, and of the mission and of the, of, of the budget um, and, and, and come to a, a mutually agreeable place. In terms of um, Funding. So this project, like many projects in the city of Pittsburgh, is um, a conglomeration of public and private money. Um, typically, the public money will come from the state of Pennsylvania. Um, the city of Pittsburgh contributed a very small amount of cash, uh, maybe like 10 grand. Um, yeah. And then we, we are blessed in the city of Pittsburgh to have uh, a series of foundations, and so there's a strong philanthropic community. Um, and then there's individuals and corporations that give. So a $6 million campaign uh, for a project like that will have dozens and dozens of contributing donors and major donors and sustaining donors. Um, but primarily, it's a mix of government, philanthropic, and individuals and corporations. OK, thank you very much. Um, there's a couple of related questions here really around the POPs in terms of um, Kind of how accessible are they? Who sets the rules on on what can and can't be done? And I suppose uh, uh, three things are mentioned here: protest, performance, rough sleeping. But what 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 are the rules? Who sets them? Yeah. So the rules are set at the time of the legal agreements being drafted for the proposal. So that is during the site plan application stage. The pops are publicly accessible. So so no one is not allowed to use them. They are entirely publicly accessible. Uh, sometimes there are in the wording of a legal agreement that after 2 a.m. Uh, the the uh, people may be asked to be removed if they are creating a nuisance. Uh, sometimes that's midnight, but that's something that is rarely exercised. Generally the design of these spaces, you know, you can achieve a lot through design. So generally the design of these spaces will dictate their use. So you won't have, for example, uh, as the the questionnaire asked uh, rock concerts happening on an impromptu basis. But they are, it's a very important that anybody is welcome in these spaces. Sure. Uh, and and a, another slightly related question is, what are the best uses made of pops in winter? So, so there's a variety of, of wintertime uh, uses that we see, largely um, um, the fact that they are pedestrian shortcuts, so they are heavily used. We also see them being used for, you know, um, dog walking. A lot of spaces actually have dog walking stations in them. Uh, we have, on average, six dogs on every floor of every new residential building in the city of Toronto. So the dog population has, has certainly uh, grown. Uh, and you walk your dog, of course, all seasons of the year. So a variety of, variety of uses for these spaces. The other thing, too, is these spaces 
are often uh, decorated seasonally with wintertime lights and Christmas lights, so they actually add to the festive ambiance of, of, of the city, of the urban environment, um, just using the, 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 the seasonal lighting that you see in wintertime as well. I don't think we have any, well, yeah, actually we do. We have a few pops that uh, have, one has an outdoor skating rink, the other one has an outdoor curling rink in an area called the distillery uh, of the city of Toronto. And, and even right now, the distillery has a Christmas market. Um, so uh, you, there's just a few examples right now of uh, a number of uh, wintertime uses that occur in, in, in some of the pops that we have in Toronto. Sure. Uh, just another, another question for you, uh, James. Uh, who are the intended audience for the guidelines? Right, so it would help the developers in terms of creating well-designed pops. It will help my fellow colleagues in planning in terms of understanding what to look for uh, when negotiating and securing pops. It would help the members of the public in terms of what their expectations are for these pops. So it is something that has a broad, broad audience. Great, thank you, James. Uh, and a question for Chris. Is the charm bracelet still active? And if so, does it have regular meetings? It's not as active as it was in terms of regular meetings. In terms of the legacy of relationships and partnerships that have established, that's what's been kind of heartening for me is to still run into people who are still doing projects with each other. Um, our initial funding essentially dried up to support more micro-granting. There are still collaborative efforts underway and, I, and, and what's also interesting is when I'm at a city meeting or a, a conversation with donors and I'm kind of in the background and they talk about the Charm Bracelet project. Um, and I mentioned our effort towards the library building and kind of trying to create a hub for this so that'll sort of become one of the, another sort of charm on the bracelet. I should also mention just briefly that the idea of the charm bracelet is that we have all these assets or charms on the north side and what we are seeking is a greater connectivity or the bracelet end of it. That's where that phrase comes from. Um, and lastly, I'll say that there is a um, foundation called the Buell Foundation in Pittsburgh. It's the oldest foundation in Pittsburgh. They're launching something called One North Side and they essentially are they don't want to say this sort of publicly, but they're sort of extending the work of the Charm Bracelet project. Um, they want to have it, they want what they're doing to have its own identity, which I completely understand because it's going into other arenas than what we were doing. But it's essentially a very similar model in terms of the ways of working. Yeah. And that actually links, thank you, that, that links directly into this question here, really. Does the North Side area have some kind of name like the city's cultural district? Right. We actually started out with the concept of creating a family district. The idea being that in Pittsburgh, we have a cultural district. It's downtown and it's defined by granite curbing. So it's very specific when you're in or not in the cultural district. And then on the south side of Pittsburgh, that's kind of like the let's go out when we're 20 something and have a good time district. And the north side with all of this, these collection of um, cultural institutions is somewhat of a family destination district. Um, but the words family and district are politically very charged. So um, sure. we have not extended that identity. We, the North Side itself is called North Side, and it has a, its own identity because of that. And um, thank you very much, Chris. A couple of uh, kind of factual questions here around POPs. Are POPs part of community benefit agreements? Are they only seen in boom parts of the metro region? So as James had mentioned, we do negotiate these spaces, certainly through this um, site plan agreement stage. But um, here in Ontario, we have something that's called Section 37 benefits. And so that is that that, that does cover community benefits. These are often um, included as part of those agreements. Um, the, I think one of the good examples that James had shown in his presentation as one of the case studies was the 300 front building. Um, so where they came in with a building at the corner originally, um, you know, through negotiations with planning and urban design staff actually reorienting and, and um, sh putting a bit more height on the site away from the corner so that we could capture some of that ground level space for, for public space. So yes, it is part of a community benefits agreement. 
So I would say I think they're certainly more um, prevalent in the downtown area, but we do have a number of um, POPs locations and, and they are, um, some of them are mapped on our, on the POPs website um, in, in some of what we call the districts. So sort of, you know, north of Toronto, east and west of the downtown. Um, those are often, they may be larger spaces or spaces adjacent to existing public parks. Um, we do have a higher number of them in the downtown simply because the scale of them in the downtown often are smaller, such as the the mid-block connections or walkways or the landscape setbacks. So, yes, yeah, certainly there's there's more of them in the downtown, but we do have um, many sites in the outlying areas. Okay, thanks, Shauna. Um, I just want to thank all of our speakers, Chris Seifert of Children's Museum Pittsburgh, James Parrack and Shauna Bowen of the City of Toronto Planning. And thanks to you for listening as well.